Welcome to Books at Berkeley. I'm your host, Judy Panolis, Associate Director of Instruction and Engagement at the Berkeley Library. Today we have with us Michael Heyman. Michael Heyman is a literature professor specializing in literary nonsense, children's literature and music, and poetry. He is the chief editor of The Tenth Raza, an anthology of Indian nonsense published in 2007, the first ever anthology of Indian nonsense in translation. His scholarship has appeared in the Children's Literature Association Quarterly, The Lion and the Unicorn, the European Journal of Humor Research, and Bookbird. His poems and stories for children can be found in the Puffin Book of Bedtime Stories, The Mustache Maharishi, and other unlikely stories. This book makes no sense, nonsense poems and worse, a volume which he also edited, and Poetry International. He is currently co-editing a new annotated and expanded edition of Alan Watts's forgotten book of poetry and philosophy called Nonsense from 1967. And for those of you who don't remember the 60s, Alan Watts was sort of a Zen Buddhist meets pop whoopie dumb kind of guy who quotes are littered in pop rock songs and posters. So that will surely be an interesting book to look for. Well, we're going to talk to Michael about two of his books that he edited and that are in our library, The Tenth Raza, an anthology of Indian nonsense. And this book makes no sense. Nonsense poems and worse. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Judy. Well, I have to ask you, is on your bio, what is arthropodiatry and why is it there? That's a very, very good question. What is arthropodiatry? Yes. Um, I think the uh, arthropodiatry is only learned in obscure colleges in the land of Grambulia. And thankfully, during some of my sabbaticals, I've spent some time in the land of Grambulia, where I was able to attain the status of Grand Puba of arthropodiatry, which may relate to the feet of insects. It may relate to other um, arcane knowledge, not all of which I'm at liberty to tell you today. Well, I, I I can see why you're interested in Indian nonsense literature, but how did you first get interested and involved with Indian nonsense literature? It's not exactly something we would think of in the so-called mainstream. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I began all of this actually as a scholar of romantic literature, English romantic literature, when I was at Oxford studying there for a master's. And I came across uh, Edward Lear and, and nonsense literature, which is what he was known for. And I thought I would be this revolutionary scholar, the first person ever to do scholarly work on literary nonsense. And for about 10 minutes, I had this vision of grandeur until I went to the library and looked up scholarship on Edward Lear. And of course, there was already a uh, small but hearty industry of nonsense scholarship. Uh, so, but I, I, despite that, I decided to go for it and did my master's and PhD in nonsense yeah. literature. Uh, during that time, I came across the translation of Shukumare that uh, features in the Tenth Rasa, and they are brilliant poems. They're really, really good. And I was I was just really amazed by them, just just as art in itself, and also interested that it came out of India as well, because there are those who, uh, over many years, have claimed that nonsense literature is some kind of exclusively English thing, which is ridiculous. But it just goes to show how prejudiced we can be sometimes, and how how kind of narrow minded. Um, and, uh, so the, the volume of Shukumare opened my eyes to that a little bit. And practically speaking, <clears throat> after I did my PhD, I came back to Boston. I was teaching at Berkeley and I had a friend who was in, um, in, who, who was in Oxford with me, but had gone back to India. 
uh, Shayuni Basu is her name, and she w- became an editor at Penguin. And she uh, she was talking to a friend there, and and they they thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have an anthology of Indian nonsense for children? And so the the original editor was not my friend, but it was uh, somebody else there who was at Puffin, and that Puffin person kind of called me up one day and said, hey, do you want to do an anthology of Indian nonsense? And I said, yes, not knowing anything about it except for the one volume I read. But I said yes, because, you know, when you're 30, you you say yes. (laughs) And um, I immediately called a friend who I had met at a conference, uh, Sumanyu Satpati, who became one of the editors. and, And he's an Indian who was one of the only people who did work on nonsense in India. And I called him and I said, is this possible? (laughs) Have I agreed to the impossible? He said, no, 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 it's possible. And so from there, I I stepped forward and and, um, went for seven years doing the research and gathering the, the, the army of people that it would take to do this kind of work. And it's really to them that I owe everything, really, for this volume. I, I was kind of the the administrative center in a way, but so much of the work came about by the other editors and and so many translators and so many other people who just gave their time very generously to make it happen. Oh, I, I, it's just amazing, Malcolm, because I imagine get, just gathering together what the possibilities of, of what could be in the anthology was one level. And then another level was getting these translations in English, but many of which are really quite good. Um, and um, we'll talk a little bit about the nature of that in a minute. And um, and also having this variety that's so representative, and I'm sure not even completely representative of all the different varieties of things. Uh, you know, India is such a vast country and culture. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was also curious because you were included and had a poem in this uh, volume. And I said, wow, I mean, that was really cool. But because it was, so, you know, this Indian culture, I was curious about that. I mean, maybe the editor gets this. To <laughs> so but, uh, you exactly. know, other than that kind of li- license, I thought that, you know, it fit in so well. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about becoming included in an anthology of great sure. storytellers and, and poets. Sure. Well, I, just, just to be clear, <laughs> so <laughs> we, don't get, we don't get lots of hate mail. Um, <laughs> the, the Tenth Rasa um, was the first book to come out. Yeah. And this was not the children's book that I had originally been asked to do. Right. So I, I had wanted, I had, I had been asked to do something more like this. Right. This is, makes no sense. Um, and I began the work doing a children's book, which would have been four languages only. And then the editors changed and wow. I got a new editor and the new editor was a penguin person. That, and, and he said, no, I want a book that includes all of India. Wow. And I was terrified. That uh, That's a really, I mean, that's a mass, such a massive undertaking. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just seven years went, at least yeah. went into this. The research alone, yeah. uh, I mean, as a research librarian, I was, you know, that, you know, yeah. it, 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 it really strikes you. Um, yeah. So, but the idea was that, and, and it makes sense also, the idea was that they, they wanted something significant, something important, something that really hadn't been done and that would make a splash. And and the children's book probably wouldn't do that um, because children's books just generally don't do that in the greater world. Um, and so they kind of influenced me and pushed me into doing the big book, which was yeah. the Tantrasa, which was not directed to children, although children can certainly read it uh, and enjoy, you know, so much of it because so much of these, so many of these texts are for children. But the book itself, as you've seen, is is heavily annotated and yeah. um, and not marketed for kids. Um, no, totally. I, so my my work does not appear in this book, right? No, um, and although, of course, as an editor, my work appears everywhere <laughs> in this book, and I and I 
and I, I worked a lot on the translations myself um, in terms of turning them into poetry. And so, I'll, you know, my hand is there in many ways, but uh, but not not overtly and not for particular pieces. Um, this book makes no sense. Uh, was a you know a, a few years later after the tenth Rasa came out, I finally got to do the book I originally wanted to do, which was the children's book, and this is the one where I included myself, <laughs> because it, for this one I just felt that it didn't need to be so strict, in terms of its right. scholarship and in terms of right. its kind of tight focus on India. This was meant to be a fun book, and the fun of it didn't have to be. Uh, you know, solely represented by Indian authors. Although I wanted it, of course, to come off of my work with the Tenth Rasa, but I wanted to open it up a little bit. For this book, I commissioned new pieces from um, people, you know, authors that I I knew through the research I had done. So there are several new pieces in here which are great, and I helped with those too. And then. Because I could, I included some of my pieces. I also included a Canadian poet who was is just one of my favorite poets, John Honor Lawson. And so I included him in here also. He wrote under a pseudonym. It was kind of it's kind of a little joke, um, <laughs> which which we reveal in the back. It's um, all nonsense. So, anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, th this book was just a bit less strict. Yes, it, 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 it definitely was a lot of fun. Um, uh, but I wanted uh, I wanted to step back a, a, a one step back and talk a little bit uh, to our listeners about the nature of nonsense literature in general. You've done so much research on it and immer immersed so much in this. Um, but its role in the society in India, or even really any society in a way. But um, you know, what are the, some of the origins of this as a genre? Mm. The origins go back into the mists of time. Uh, but there are two general uh, tracts that it came from. And one is the folk track, and one is the literary track. And the folk track includes nursery rhymes and game songs. Um, uh, it includes all the things that children produce on the playground. It includes uh, folk theater. It, it can include many things, any, anything coming out of the folk culture, generally the oral culture. And, you know, every culture has that. And it's quite indicative of the culture itself and the forms and the topics and, and how it's dealt with and how the nonsense is used. Uh, of course, then there's the other side, the kind of the literary side of it. And the... In, in the English tradition, that kind of starts around the 17th century, although that also goes back farther as well. Um, but some of the best documented stuff and the stuff that's a bit closer to what we today call literary nonsense comes from around that period. And it is a, uh, it, it was practiced by these highly educated literate people who were who were parodying politics or art or other high culture ideas and they wrote and they used nonsense as a tool of derision as a tool of play as a tool of fun and so the folk track and the literary track uh, are the two tracks and they kind of come together when you talk about what we now call literary nonsense and people like Edward Lear or Lewis Carroll or uh, in India, Shukumar Ray or Mangesh Padgivkar or these kinds of guys, um, you get this kind of fusion of these, these different branches of nonsense. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit, you called your book the 10th Raza. So to tell our audience a little bit about what the term Raza refers to uh, and how it's related to spirit of whimsy or whatever and sure and how what what are the first nine <laughs> so why, why is this the tent right right um so rasa is a aesthetic term in in indian aesthetics and it comes from 
uh, an ancient idea that was expressed by Natya Sastra, uh, but sorry, by Bharata in the book Natya Sastra, twelve hundred years ago, um, and codified. Uh, the word itself is, comes from Sanskrit, which literally means the sap or the juice of something living. But when you apply that to art, the meaning is something like the different feelings you get from art. And that is art of any kind. So it could be music or dance or poetry, what have you. They categorize these different possible feelings you could get in, as the rasas. And so you have uh, love, anger, uh, happiness, um, disgust, heroism, compassion, uh, fear, and wonder. And that makes eight. And then a little bit later, they added one more, which uh, was peace, shanti. And so when an Indian aesthetic theorist is, is talking about music, say, or poetry, or a musician or a poet is talking about their work, they may speak of it in terms of the, of the different rasas that it evokes in the audience. Now, uh, in the most famous book in West Bengal, and possibly in India, but this is a, a Bengali writer, uh, Shukumar Ray, his book, Abul Tabul, had a little introduction. And he said, I don't have the quote in front of me, but he, he basically said, if you don't like the rasa, this rasa, then you shouldn't read this book. <laughs> and, and he called it, so he was trying to deflect critics, of course, but he called it in Bengali, uh, Kayal Rosh, or Rosh is the word for uh, rasa in Bengali. Uh, Kayal is a difficult word to translate in English. Uh, we, we, we translate it as whimsy, but that doesn't quite cover it because it also has implications of deep thought. And so it's, it's kind of playful, but it's also kind of deep and contemplative, in addition to being kind of the whimsy that we think of with the imagination. And so, so Shukumare invented that and, and applied it to his own work partly as a, as a deflection of critics, but I, but his son thought, and I think many think, that he was, he was also quite serious about it. And that by introducing this new rasa, he actually was creating a permission in a way for his own writing of nonsense within the context of the Indian arts. Uh, it's just, it seems so much like there's, it's like holding two thoughts at the same time and, and, and that are so, you know, being meditative and also whimsy seems so different in, Eng in English, the right. you know, English way of thinking. But by the way, on the cover of the Tenth Rasa, that's them. So each of these faces oh. represents one of these feelings, moods. And mm -hmm. then, of course, the one in the center, the big one, that's all crazy and hilarious. That's that's the Tenth Rasa. That's the oh. Uh, I'm very glad you that to me. Well, we'll we'll put a good picture of that up so that we can see that closer too. Um, and see, this is one another reason why it's good to have these ex <laughs> this explained. Um, well, I mean, it just seems like it's such a rooted and a sophisticated art form, and it touches on the linguistics and play of words and logic or illogic. Um, this sort of fantasy art form i guess not nonsense no sense uh but it, it you know it's really an art form uh you mentioned in your introduction and there are several writers by the way uh, to the to the listeners that are writing in the introduction it isn't one just one person um there are several different very good essays to read um as well as the actual poems um you talk about it having uh, running through Indian culture from ancient times to the modern, and we kind of went over that. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about translation, this issue of translation, because obviously uh, 
there's so many languages, native Indian languages, and not only the major languages, and we all know that India is such a vast, vast geographic area, you know, and then, you know, in ancient times, people didn't travel that much. And so dialects and languages are related to each other, you know, I'm sure grew up around the continent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so one would presume in each one of these ancient languages, different distinctive kinds of plays of words or game, you know, word games or whatever would have evolved. And in nonsense, poetry and rhyme, how does one convey the spirit of a made up word from all these different uh, languages into English, which is what has happened in this book. And then this internal rhyme scheme sometimes are, I know that poetry and translation, you know, do you reflect the meaning, the true meaning of the text, or do you, you know, create a rhyme, or do you create something that has to do with the inflection or the, you know, context, but with different words? It's just such a hard skill. And doing that with poetry is even harder. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about this, because, I mean, so many of these poems have meter and rhyme that are also work in English. And so, you know, I don't have a sense of what they would have been in the original languages, but talk a little bit about that translation and those issues that came up and yeah. what were some of the solutions? I guess you had so many translators as well who were also poets, so I take it and often and right. Mm -hmm. Translation is always tragedy. I mean, it's always so. <laughs> it's always disaster right it's so hard yeah and it's 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 extra disastrous when it comes to nonsense that's not to say that there are not successes and that there is not beauty and 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 some fidelity to the original as well but we have to begin with tragedy because so much is lost of course so much is lost i'm laughing but i just i'm, I'm in, in appreciation of you using that term um and i use the word difficult but translation i find is is you know a, certainly of literary forms and of a high literary culture is so difficult yeah get those those inferences and nuances the language absolutely um nonsense is particularly hard in some ways, but it's not as hard as people might think. I think when, when if, if people know anything about nonsense, they often know, say, the poem uh, Jabberwocky yeah. from Through the Looking Glass. And Jabberwocky is full of neologism or new words. And those are particularly difficult to translate. But neologism is just one technique of the nonsense artist. And there are many techniques. Uh, they and they, they're roughly into two categories, uh, one being language. And so neologism is a language game that one can play. Um, and, and the language category of nonsense making is harder to convey in translation, certainly. Not, not necessarily impossible, um, but there's usually some kind of loss with it. The other half of nonsense, really, which is usually the greater half, is the play and the subversion of logic. So we have play and subversion of language, we have play and subversion of logic. That's much easier to translate. Logic does not uh, generally rely on, on the finest definition of a word. Uh, I mean, of course, linguists are tearing their hair out right now as I say this, but but um, generally speaking, if we're talking about, say, a cause and effect, you know, I see a cloud, it starts to rain, or I see a cloud, and now there is a giraffe running down the street. And that's a faulty cause and effect. And to translate, I see a cloud and a giraffe is now running down the street, is very easy to translate. So in and that's that's the main mode of nonsense art creation is really the play with the logic. Um, yeah. So, so much of the effect of nonsense can be easily translated. 
But then, of course, you you get to the linguistic stuff, which is much more difficult. And um, and there are lots of different ways that we try to get as close as we can to the original meaning. And I can give you know a quick example. Uh, there was that would be great. I mean, because talking about it is one thing, but hearing it, yeah. Makes more sense out of nonsense. <laughs> uh, there's there are many uh, many examples I could point to, and and there are uh, there are footnotes in the volume in the tenth rasa to uh, with some of these at least where we thought it was particularly interesting how the translation s succeeded or failed or whatever it was. Um, this is a, a poem uh, by Nanda Kishore Bala called Raven O Raven, uh, translated by Sumanya Sakpati who was one of the editors of the volume. Um, the other editor was uh, Anushka Ravi Shankar, who uh, had other specialties. And she's, we might talk about her later. She's also a, a nonsense artist herself. And she was foundational in, in helping make this book happen. But this poem called Raven or Raven, I'll just read the, the, first, the first stanza here is, Raven or Raven, you call from the murk of the shifting high hills where the three CD lurks. And you might think, what is the three CD? <laughs> and this is a nonsense word. This is, uh, it's partly a neologism, it's partly a portmanteau where you smash words together. Not Instead of just inventing a totally new word, you smash some, some word, two or three or four words together to make one word. Uh, this word, 3CD. He's lurking. It's a creature. You can tell from the context of this that it's a creature lurking in the hills. Uh, the, the ravens are calling out. This is this gothic scene. And from the murk of the high hills, the 3CD is lurking. And it's some kind of monster. Now, the original language is Odia. And uh, the, the, the word in Odia is Tini, uh, tini Manjika. Teeny manjika. Now, uh, teen means three. Um, manjika means two different things depending on how you twist it. But it can mean it can mean a seed. It can also mean a prostitute. And when and when you put it all together, uh, Sumanyu told me that it has this kind of foreboding sound to it. There, there's something about the sound of teeny manjika. Teeny Manjika, that, that sounds kind of scary, mm -hmm. um, but it also includes the meanings of those of those other words. And nonsense is often about excess of meaning, not lack. And so in Teeny Manjika, you have excess of meaning. What three seed whore? What? <laughs> you know, monster? How, how does this make any sense at all? You're, you're, you're juggling all these meanings and you can't pick one and say, oh, it's this one. So we, we struggled, uh, Simanyo and I struggled in translating this poem, in particular this word, because we needed to get a word that sounded kind of uh, scary, but also included some of the, the partial meanings that were implied by the original word. And so I came up with three CD. It's, it's the word three and CD smashed together, which it, it was partly just a coincidence of language that CD in English refers to seeds, and it also refers to seediness, as in right. like a prostitute sort of, right. potentially. And so that was just luck, you know, it was luck that, that English happened to have a word that actually embraced the meanings of these. And so, and, and when we smashed them together, three CD, I, I also like the sound of the, the long E's, three CD. You know, it, it 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 also got that sound maybe of a little bit scary, uh, and so I I was so happy, <laughs> and and Sophia was happy also, that that we we found a word that that reflects in many ways uh, the original sound and meaning. But is it teeny manjika? No, it's a different word, and so of course so much is lost just in losing the sound itself, even detached from the meaning. But anyway, uh, there's, there's yeah, I mean, of a success. <laughs> I mean, it was it, it it does convey that sense of lurkingness, like that e, you know, is kind of a yeah, uh, 
one of those sounds that could be scary or spooky or whatever. Right. Sound is very important to nonsense. Yeah. It, it's often more important than than s semantic meaning. Um, it's just that the, the whatever is evoked by sound. Well, I, it's funny you mentioned that because I found myself when I was reading the book to go back and kind of read the poetry aloud. There's mm. some, some of it, you know, had pretty cool English rhyme and meter to it and also was funny. I mean, it just came across to me as being really funny or, you know, <laughs> just so strange. And I had no idea what it was going on, what, what it meant. Um, but, you know. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, the comment that they have like more meaning than less meaning is also something that came across in some of this literature because you realize that there's so many different things that it could be interpreted as. Mm -hmm. Interpretations could be endless, right. you know. Right. So there, you know, it does have, you know, rather than specificity, it's sort of a a, a vague sense that you know won't we'll wonder what that is, and everybody could kind of come up with their own idea. Yeah, this is the nature of good nonsense art. I, yeah. I I liken it to juggling. And in in the introduction, actually in the introduction to this book makes no sense. I talk about I, I use this analogy of juggling where good nonsense is juggling. It's juggling meanings. And so you're juggling all these meanings at once. And as soon as you try to hold on to one meaning, you're not juggling anymore. <laughs> you're nonsense done. is juggling. <laughs> It's the juggling that makes it nonsense. But it all it also has to create those balls to juggle. If it doesn't create those balls, if it doesn't create those meanings, then it's just gibberish. And gibberish is not the art of nonsense. Although sometimes one can include a little bit of gibberish within a text as a as a technique, but you you have to be very careful about that because if there's not enough meaning, to create tension between meanings, then people get bored and it's just not good art. I, I know that like some of the words, you know, will have, you know, evoke, evoke imagery or whatever. And some, and in, there are a couple of uh, places in there where images are included. I especially love the ones where they mixed up the animals and, you know, oh, yeah. that's such a kind of a common thing. I, I think of like, for example, my grandchildren have like this kind of toy where it's little magnet parts of animals and you they mix it and they get it you know they think that's really funny because they're not supposed to look like an alligator with mm. you know, an elephant tail or whatever so uh yeah you get that i think that kind of universalism comes across that people can kind of get that and enjoy that mm -hmm. and and relate to it um i was just wanted to ask you one thing and that was your title on the, the children's book, this book makes no sense, nonsense, poems, and worse. What, what did you mean by the uh, worse part? <laughs> I just had to ask you that. Um, that was such a great title. But if you could comment on that. Yes. Well, <laughs> I, I think it, it had to do with the, with the general dismissal of nonsense art as worthless. Um, after mm. all, that's that's the meaning of the word. We say, oh, that's nonsense. Poppycock, balderdash. Nonsense can be used very dismissively. And it unfortunately is the word that became attached to this kind of literature. But as, as we've been talking about, it's it it's not nonsense. It makes lots of sense in many ways. It doesn't make sense in some ways. It's a kind of balance in between sense and nonsense. Um, but because it is playful, because it is sometimes perceived as being written for children, which is not always true, uh, because it is fantastical often, it is dismissed. And that's a great shame, I would say, because it is a ancient and respected and and uh, technical art that that should be respected of course i'm somewhat biased but we're just but the title is just playing on this tendency out there to dismiss nonsense and so rather than be an apologist for it we're just going to double down <laughs> and not 
Al Sands poems and worse. Get ready. Strap yourself in because this is going to be deep nonsense, a deep dive into nonsense. And hopefully after after you read these texts, you see that that play is not all frivolity, that play is an embracing of, of fun, but also always serious in certain ways. Yeah, I mean, one of the senses that will um, will happen is it will touch your funny bone. Yeah. Tickle your funny bone. Um, I was wondering if you uh, would be willing to read one of the poems in the book, um, either one of the worst items or <laughs> one of your favorites. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and uh, I think that for people to hear one of these poems that get a sense that of this balance between yes fantasy and nonsense and whimsy but also this sort of yeah there's something deeper there too which sure. is a great art can and provide yeah i would be happy to let me go it's very difficult of course to, to pick these out um well, if you want to do more than one, I mean, you know, I can never choose one. It's like potato chip. Right? It, it, it is tough. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the editors of the volume was Anushka Ravi Shankar, uh, who was a very well-known uh, writer in India and particularly well-known as a nonsense writer. And I was fortunate enough to kind of find her when I was beginning my research and she became an integral part of the whole project. Um, and so we included some of her work, of course, because it's so good. Uh, so this piece. I also wanted to mention to the audience that um, one of the things that came across my desk was an article that talked about, um, you know, kind of this history and how important women were in the founding of the journals and getting uh, a lot of the public early publication days of nonsense poetry, there were a lot of women involved in making that a reality and supporting the poet, the Indian poets, and in getting their work published. Hmm. It's we 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 tried in this research to to find uh, as many women uh, writers as we could, and it was a real struggle because nonsense is typically done by men. Um, there are a few women, and Anushka is a great example, as you, as you mentioned, there, there are a few women who have done it successfully, but it, it's a whole other discussion as to yeah. why there are not so many women in this field, especially when women uh, are much uh, more of the group of writers for children. And because nonsense tends to be written for children, you would think that there'd be lots of women writers of nonsense, but there are not. Oh. And that is interesting. <laughs> um, so, but that's another discussion, which we could talk about later if you want. Uh, but let me read uh, Anushka's, one of Anushka's pieces. Okay. Uh, this, this piece actually comes from a book called Wish You Were Here, which is a set of postcards. And they... The, the publisher, T Tara Books, which is a fantastic Indian publisher, Tara um, commissioned commercial artists to create commercial art for postcards. And, and then anu Anushka wrote this, uh, wrote verses for each of these postcards and the verse kind of appears on the postcard as as some kind of missive from some crazy relative who's writing on the postcard. And so this one is called Uncle Tetrahedron in a Pyramid, Egypt. Uncle Tetrahedron had four points to make. He made them clear and slow. The first was one. The second, two. The third was 84. The fourth, he said, and then he stopped and never spoke a word. He now lives in a pyramid in Egypt, so we heard. 
Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Makes you think, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it see it leads you down a, a road of sense. So you think it's going to make sense, right? And, and this, then... this is the great art of the nonsense artist. Yeah, it's always it's always misdirecting, but you have to direct before you can misdirect. Right. The setup. Yeah. So th there are many other ones. Uh, do you want to read one more? Sure. I can read. I can do one that is a great favorite in India. So oh, I. Right. Yeah. After after this book makes no sense came out, I um, I traveled around and performed these pieces for uh, kids at schools. And this one was probably the most uh, popular of them all. And the only thing you have to know about it is that it is using the language of a Sanskrit hymn. And so that's something that a Western audience might not be familiar with, but it's, it's a kind of chanting hymn that is of religious spiritual significance. And it's normally done in Sanskrit. Um, and, and it's usually, obviously a, a Sanskrit hymn is a serious kind of composition that is performed and received seriously about spiritual matters. This one is by a woman named Sarita Padki. Um, it's written in Marathi. Uh, it was translated by Anushka Ravi Shankar. Uh, and Anushka and I actually debated a lot over this one. Um, so it goes like this. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I, I mentioned the title. It's called The Bathing Hymn. Om Havam Batham Namaha. Om. Take off them, clothe them, the maha. On the body, apply them, oil them, the maha. Scrub, scrub them, the maha. Rub, rub them, the maha. Scrub, scrub them, the maha. Om. On the body, pour them, water them, the maha. Glug, glug them, the maha. Blug, blug them, the maha. Glug, glug them, the maha. Om. Apply them, soap them, the maha. Scrub, scrub them, the maha. Rub, rub them, the maha. Work up them, lather them, the maha. Om. Pour them more water, them, the maha. Glug, glug them, the maha. Blug, blug them, the maha. Wash off them, soap them, the maha. Om, wipe them, body them, the maha. Wear them, clothes them, the maha. Om, nice them, clean them, the maha. Bring out them, snack them, the maha. I can see where kids would really love that one. The kids, and so I would sit, I would sit on the ground, the cross-legged position as, as one would do with this kind of thing, possibly, and and perform it somewhat like I just did. And they were rolling in the aisles <laughs> with laughter because they they understand what this is making fun of. Right. They got all they got all the connotations and nuances yeah. Yeah. of that. And this is deeply it. subversive. <laughs> deeply subversive. This is and and, and I had I've I've had uh, adults come up to me after the show and say, you know, you really you 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 might reconsider doing the bathing hymn because some people might be offended by this but i really love it <laughs> and so everybody would tell me that they loved it but they said some people would be offended by it and that's probably true and it's probably even more true now under the current political situation in india with hindu nationalism being yeah you know the the, the current that has been around for many years now under uh, modi and so this is this is just the kind of thing that they might indeed frown upon now. And I might have more trouble performing this now than I did at the time. Yeah. Um, but 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 everybody loved it. And they and they like this play. And this is one of the things that distinguishes Indian nonsense. Um, there's so much play with spirituality. And and that's and that's okay. 
it 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 the nonsense is this kind of tool and weapon that can be used to tear down the hierarchies, whatever they are. And spirituality, uh, religion, the the caste system that is underneath all of that, all of these things are implied in this kind of uh, Sanskrit hymn. And then to, to turn it into someone taking a bath is completely absurd and and makes you think, it makes you question. And also a holy act for a lot of folks, you know, and, uh, you know, I guess it's really healthy when you can kind of laugh at yourself and uh, in a culture and um, not take we, everything. We think, overly we think that's crazy. healthy. We think it's healthy to yeah. be able to kind of laugh at yourself. And yeah. um, and it's good to know that other cultures feel the same way. Mm -hmm. um, well, this has been really a fascinating discussion and I could probably go on for a lot longer, but uh, I leave it to our listeners to check out the book and the library. Uh, I think you will enjoy it and get a lot out of it, both deep and humorous at the same time. And there's a lot, a lot there, there, <laughs> as I like to say these days. Um, so thank you so much uh, for talking with us at Books at Berkeley. Thank you for presenting your work. And thank you for so many years of research and work on this. This was an amazing um, cultural art to bring to the attention of the English reader, which is really a great service. And thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it.